to you, buddy. Um, today, I'd like to present to you the factors affecting the nonlinear seismic response of unanchored liquid storage tanks. Liquid storage tanks are basically huge containers used to store liquids. They are important components of lifeline and industrial facilities, and they are used in many, uh, and they are critical elements in municipal water supply and firefighting systems. They are used to store oil, gas, and natural gas, chemicals, drinks, uh, and liquefied natural gas that we use heat uh, for heating in the winter. The damage occurs to uh, liquid storage tanks during seismic events has implications far beyond the mere economic value of the tank and its contents. So we don't care much about the price of the tank as much as we care about the things that are contained inside the tank. Why? For example, um, in the 1933 Long Beach earthquake or the 1971 earthquakes in San Fernando, the, um, the failure of liquid storage tank resulted in the loss of public water supply. Water leaked out. So people won't have water to drink after the earthquake. Um, failure of a tank that stores chemical material will cause huge, extensive, uncontrolled fire. It will cause environmental pollution. And you don't even have the water to extinguish the fire because of the loss of public water supply. Therefore, you know, it's very dangerous if they fail. Not only because we lose the tank as a value, but also because we lose the things are inside the tank that we need or we want to contain and prevent from polluting the environment. Um, this is why we need to consider the seismic forces in designing of these liquid storage tanks. We would like to talk next about classification of liquid storage tanks. Actually, I borrowed here a sample tank, so that would be something to use to uh, explain things. Liquid storage tanks can be classified based on two criteria. The first one is the axis of symmetry. So we have vertical tanks and we have horizontal tanks. That's the first criteria. The second criteria is, could be based on the ground location or support conditions. We have elevated tanks. This is the ground. We have elevated tanks. We have on-ground tanks, and then we have underground tanks. And the on-ground tanks, which are our subject of today, based on the connection between the tank and the foundation, if the tank is anchored to the foundation, this is called anchored tank. But if the tank is not anchored, just placed like this, without any anchorage, this is called an anchored tank, which is our subject for today, which is the vertical, on-ground, unanchored liquid storage tanks. We can see here the difference between anchored and unanchored tanks. Anchored tanks need to be anchored to the huge, big foundation, expensive foundation, to prevent the tank uplift during seismic event. On the other hand, unanchored tanks are much cheaper and much easier in construction. Why? Because we don't need such a huge, expensive foundation. All we need to do is just come back to the soil and just place the tank on the top of the soil perhaps put a ring, concrete ring wall under the tank wall. Sometimes this concrete wall is even omitted. So it is as cheap as just come back the soil, put the tank. This is why essentially most of the tanks in the field are unanchored. Why? Because they are much cheaper in construction and much easier. In the above ground tank, is there still a little bit of lateral soil because of the depression of the tank? Or do you model it Not really. ideally? Uh, just come back the soil yeah. and put the tank. And that's about it. You can have a ring wall, or you uh, sometimes this ring wall is committed. There are many challenges in the analysis of unanchored tanks. The first challenge arises due to the fact that we have successive contact and separation between the tank base plate. Oh, the other way. Successive contact and separation between the tank base plate and foundation. No anchorage, so when the tank is rocking back and forth, you get successive contact and separation, which is called the uplift problem that we would be addressing. So when you hear uplift, you know what I'm talking about. The second thing is that the large amplitude liquid sloshing, the gravity waves that form on the liquid surface on the top there, 
they are nonlinear gravity waves. Why? The linear gravity wave theory says that the wave height is small compared to the depth of the liquid. So we can ignore that height and we can basically consider the free surface to be horizontal surface and it's constant with time. We can if we can do this here because the wave height is comparable to the depth. So we can't use that. So we have to use the nonlinear gravity waves theory, which is nonlinear because of many things. One of them is that the location of the free surface at any time is unknown. So you have unknown boundary. Two, the slope of the free surface is unknown. So all these unknowns come into play and make a lot of nonlinearities in the, the, the differential equations. The third thing is that this uplift, which is the distance between the foundation and the tank when the tank uplifts, this uplift distance is in the order of sometimes 12 inches. 12 inches. So what is the thickness of the base plate? Half an inch, one inch. So when you have an uplift of 12 inches versus the thickness, which is one inch, then you get into something called large amplitude, uh, you get into something called large deflection theory. You can no longer employ the small deflection theory that assumes that the geometry doesn't change with deflection. No, here the geometry is changing with deflection and you get coupled membrane and bending effect. Normally membrane and bending effects are uncoupled for flat plates. Now they are coupled because of the large amplitude uh, uplift right here. We have the same thing happening to the tank shell. The tank shell also, you know, has large amplitude. You know, the tank shell thickness is about half an inch or one inch. Containing this huge liquid, it's like putting water in balloon and shaking the balloon, you know. So you get uh, large deformations for the shell compared to the thickness. They are, sometimes these deformations are five, six inches. The, the shell thickness is, you know, one inch. So again, we have to employ the large deformation theory. Um, other nonlinearities also arise due to the uh, plasticity. Plasticity of what? Plasticity between the tank base plate and the tank wall. This is the tank base plate. This is the tank wall. Okay? They are connected. Because of excessive uplift, you get a plastic hinge forming. You get a plastic hinge forming between the tank base plate and the tank wall. This plastic hinge is, you know, need to be considered in the analysis. Another thing is that as the tank rocks back and forth, you get buckling on one side, and then when the tank rocks to the other side, you get buckling on the other side and post-buckling on the side that buckled before. And you have buckling, post-buckling, buckling, post-buckling, post and, you know, keeps going back and forth. This is another complexity of the problem. You have the soil tank interaction that needs to be also addressed. All these complexities combined in this problem, you have the nonlinear liquid structure interaction. Why? The structure is vibrating, so it delivers velocity to the boundary of the liquid. And then the liquid is delivering back to the structure hydrodynamic pressure. This simultaneous exchange of energy is nonlinear, and we have the nonlinear liquid structure interaction problem. Simplified solutions have been attempted as usual. Engineers always try to come up with WL square over 8 equivalent to, <laughs> to do the design because they are, you know, the practicing engineers, they are fond of WL square over 8 kind of formula, simplified formula. They don't want to get into the, uh, you know, these tough buttons on the calculators. You know, the maximum they want to use is cosine and sine square root. They don't want to use all these difficult, complicated buttons, you know. They want to stay simple. So, uh, several people try to simplify the problem. But obviously, they have simplified the problem too much to the extent that we had a lot of earthquake, a lot of failures, a lot of failure to the unanchored tanks after earthquake events. And that highlighted the need for a careful, accurate analysis of such tanks. And because of all these complexities, this problem was cited as one of the most challenging problems in the uh, fluid structure systems. In this work, analysis was done using all these uh, nonlinearities that we will be talking about, explaining the method in a few seconds. Before I go into the method, let me, and before we try to understand the, 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 how do we model the problem, let me explain how do these tanks behave. And 
We do that by observing the behavior in the field after real earthquakes. The behavior of these tanks range or failure the after earthquakes. These tanks have a range of response from total failure all the way to as from as severe as total failure to as minor as just failure of the pipes connected to the tank. So they range all the way from a total collapse of the entire tank, that's one kind which is the most severe, and to failure of the connections, just the pipe connected to the tanks. And we will see that in the picture. That's a dramatic picture here where we see a total collapse of the entire tank. Another one here, you know, you can see the whole tank. What happens, what I think happened is the tank stands on its toe like this. And as a result of the weight, the tank will buckle like that. Okay? And then when the tank buckles like that, under the weight, it will, it will go like this. And then, <laughs> here's the tank. But this is how it happens. When the tank stands on its toe, you know, I can read them straight and using yours if you're done with it. <laughs> you know, you get the total collapse of the entire tank. Now, we have also something called elephant foot buckling. Elephant foot buckling is basically, um, happens in broad tanks. Broad tanks that are fat and short. These kind of tanks, they buckle this way. They, they bulk out, so you get this kind of elephant foot buckling. Why? Because of inside pressure, radial pressure to pushing the tank wall to the outside, and then the foundation pushing the tank wall up. So outside and up, you get this kind of buckling, which is the elephant foot buckling. Then there's another kind of buckling. This is also an elephant foot buckling. There is another kind of buckling that takes place into the tall tanks, tanks that are thin and tall, which is called diamond shape buckling. It's not elephant foot buckling, it's diamond shape buckling. This is what happened to this can. It was a diamond shape buckling. And then we have here an example of the failure of the anchors. These are the anchors used. This is an anchor seat and this is an anchor bolt used to anchor the tank to the foundation. This anchor is completely pulled out of foundation. Why? Because of the seismic event was so severe. And here we have just failure of the pipe connected. And this is severe also. Why? Because as I mentioned at the beginning, if you remember that, we worry about loss of the contents of the tanks. We're not worried much about the tank itself as much as worried about the loss of the contents of the tank. So don't look here and say, oh, so what? Pipe failed, fix it later on. Okay, how about the water inside? It's gone. How about chemicals? They cause problems and things like that. So it is, we don't even want this kind of failure. And we also have failure of the roof because of the gravity waves, boom, hitting the roof. They cause buckling of the roof from the top. And let's see historical what have been what researchers have been doing about this problem in the past. Historically, a number of studies were, were reported in the literature trying to solve this problem. However, due to, the complexities, due to the complexity of the problem, most of these studies were experimental in nature. They were experimental in nature, and they were trying to simulate these conditions. Can I borrow yours? Okay. <laughs> what they used to do is they do something called static tilt test. Static tilt test is basically they, put, they bring a table and they put the tank on the table and then they tilt it like this. When they tilt the tank like this, oops, you can see that the tank is overturning, right? When the tank wants to overturn, it uplifts, right? And this will simulate the uplifting mechanism happening during a seismic event. So this way, by observing this uplifting response, then they get some idea about the, 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 this mechanism, how it is happening, and how to, uh, you know, how to uh, calculate it, uh, or how to come up with a closed form solution to pass out to the practicing engineers to use for that. You mean they actually test it when it falls back? They, they bring it just to impending tip and then they let it fall back? Or, no, or they tilt it like this. Yeah. So the gravity component parallel to this tilting table, 
would cause an overturning moment. Oh, so it uplifts like that. They don't try and turn the table back to let it fall. That's a, okay. yeah, that's a static test. They don't try any psychedelic loading or anything like that. And um, that's the and some of these tests were done in a full scale tank. So they built an actual one-to-one -one scale tank and they tilted on the tilting tape. Some of them on half a scale. How about numerical discretization approaches after you know digital computers and evolution of digital computers and the numerical techniques, finite element, finite difference? Several people have used that before trying to model the problem using numerical discretization techniques. However, every time somebody is trying to do something with this, he will or she will try to simplify the problem in a certain way. For example, or try to linearize the problem in a certain way. For example, uh, one study was replacing the base plate by equivalent springs. So in the finite element model, they take out the plate and they put springs under the wall and they say these springs are equivalent to the base plate. Well, what is equivalent, you know? Equivalent is question. Second, uh, performing pseudo-dynamic analysis in the loop of the full dynamic analysis, basically simulating the static tail test, but on the computer. And again, we would like a full blown up dynamic analysis that has all this dynamic liquid structure interaction and everything. And linearization of the portion of the problem, such as doing what? Considering the tank wall to be rigid. Rigid with five, six inches of deflection? I don't think so. Ignoring liquid sloshing. They ignore the free surface surface liquid slush, the large amplitude, just to consider as a small amplitude liquid slush. Smearing the fluid mass to the shell, basically calculate how much fluid mass we have and smear it to the shell. Lump it to the shell. So the total mass of the shell will include the mass of the liquid and that would be an element and there will be no liquid at all. And this way they call it the added mass approach. They add the mass of the liquid to the tank wall and they analyze the tank without the liquid or use of approximate analytical closed form expressions for the hydrodynamic pressure to eliminate the liquid degrees of freedom. So instead of modeling the liquid as a liquid with liquid degrees of freedom, they take it out and this, they, they use closed form solutions to substitute for the hydrodynamic pressure, which completely eliminating the nonlinear liquid structure interaction property. So it becomes just a structural problem. And the, in this approach, a the, everything was modeled basically using the liquid was modeled using an Eulerian formulation. The liquid, the I the uh, the free surface location, the location of the free surface was tracked by using an Eulerian Lagrangian formulation. The Lagrangian formulation is capable of tracking a movable surface. The nonlinear liquid structure interaction was also modeled. The shell itself, the tank wall, was modeled using a nonlinear curved shell element that has all these features, the uh, large deformation technology and the plasticity technology and all these things are there. And the uh, foundation is modeled. There are two ways to model foundation. is the tensionless springs or using an actual foundation element and having a gap element or contact element between the foundation and the base plate. So there was, the, the program had contact analysis to do such a job. And finally, um, so if, if I want to break down what I've just explained into parts or constituents, I would say part one would be the nonlinear analysis, dynamic analysis of shell. As I said, a curved shell element was used that has all these features to take care of all this large deformation and plasticity. Second, contact analysis. You know, we had a contact analysis between two bodies, contact forces. Contact could happen between two different bodies or the same body. You know, I've used this one because, of course, the foundation and the uh, uh, tank are different. Third, the liquid itself. And in order to eliminate the structure, we assume that the tank is rigid. And these are the three degrees of freedom that describe the motion of the tank, because it's a rigid tank, X, Y, and rotation, and all its rigid body to eliminate the tank degrees of freedom, and to eliminate the liquid structure interaction, and just focus on the liquid with the nonlinear free surface slush. We can see why it's nonlinear, by the way. We can see here this formula 
delta squared pi Bernoulli equation, if you recall, v squared over 2, right? v squared over 2g. Remember, in Bernoulli equation, v squared over 2g, v squared is delta squared pi. This is a source of nonlinearity. Here, the source of nonlinearity is the slope of the free surface, delta partial h by partial x, partial h by partial z. This is the slope of the free surface, which is unknown at any time. So this is another source. So if I want to linearize that, I would cross this term out, and then I would cross these two terms out. Now I have linearized the dynamic condition. I have linearized the kinematic conditions. And these are the resulting equations. And you notice that we don't have any liquid degrees of freedom here. Because this is just, I'm sorry, stop, rewind, play again, play. You notice that, I was just rewinding because I made a mistake. You notice here that we don't have any structural degrees of freedom because we have eliminated the structure. Okay. And last but not least, we modeled the liquid structure interaction problem. Again, velocity from the tank to the liquid, higher dynamic pressure from the liquid to the tank. All using that Bernoulli formula. And we noticed that nonlinear term here wasn't ignored. And there are you know, five kinds of liquid structure interaction. This is the one that is category five that applies to this problem. All right, overall system. You get a nasty system that has structural degree of freedom. Delta U represents the structural degree of freedom. This is acceleration. This is velocity. And this is displacement. Delta phi here represents the um, fluid degrees of freedom. Delta H represents the free surface elevation at any time. And delta lambda, lambda represents the Lagrange multipliers that you use to enforce the contact constraints. Because you have contact constraints you want to enforce so that the contact surface don't penetrate into each other, right? And things like that, and they all move together. You enforce that using Lagrange multipliers. Finally, using the mark techniques, you know, just like our friend here with uh, just alpha equal to one half and beta equal to, I don't recall how much, without trying to play with all this numerical damping or anything like that, you come up with the coefficient uh, matrix. And this coefficient matrix was horrible. You know, you had how many degrees of freedom? Lots of degrees of freedom right there. And this is highly nonlinear matrix. And you have two ways to solve for nonlinear matrix, as we know. You know, we have a way even to use full Newton method or Newton Robson method. The uh, basically one way, just to explain one way, is to not to update the stiffness matrix after every iteration and keep keep iterating until you converge to the solution. Another way is to update the stiffness matrix or the coefficient matrix here after every iteration. And this way you get very fast conversions. But for every time you want to update the coefficient matrix, you wait a month. <laughs> it's not really a month, but that would make the runtime incredible. You know, that would make a one problem run uh, take six months to run because that's a time history. You know, every point oh one second, and you have thirty seconds ground motion, so you have like three thousand time steps. You don't want to do that, you know, because it will take six months to run. So what I did here, I um, I came up with a new technique where I basically isolate the linear degrees of freedom and from the nonlinear degrees of freedom. The linear degrees of freedom are calculated and factorized, factorized using crowd decomposition. Because crowd decomposition, when you factorize the coefficient matrix here, this factorization will have nothing to do with this part of the matrix. This is the secret about crowd factorization. If you factorize this part, it will not be affected by this part. So if you calculate this part and factorize it and store it, you do it once for the entire problem and forget about it. You don't have to worry about it anymore. This part, which is nonlinear and changing and changing and changing, will not affect the factorization of this part. And this is the secret about crowd factorization. It's a beautiful secret if you want to use it and employ it. This part, after every iteration, you can update it, factorize it, update it, factorize it. And this part is what? It's a small part, just the nonlinear degrees of freedom. You know, 
very, very little compared to the linear degrees of freedom. And this way, instead of having six months run time, you can finish the problem in, you know, a day or two. Okay, now using that technology, now we would like to study the factors, you know, affecting the response of an anchored liquid storage tanks. And these are the factors that I have studied or I have presented in this study. Anchorage, what's the difference between the response of anchored versus unanchored? Are they the same or different? Would like to answer this question. Foundation stiffness, if the foundation is stiff or flexible, any changes? Considering with large deflections, when we added the large deflection, did it make any difference? What is it? Plasticity, when we considered plasticity, what happened? Base plate thickness, when we make the base plate thinner, what happens? Okay, number one. This is, before we do that, let me show you the model. This is the model of the tank. The tank is from the outside and the liquid is from the inside. We assume a full tank right here. And these are the two ground motions used. One of the 1940 central earthquake and the other one is the Northridge earthquake. One is 20 seconds duration, the other one is 30 second duration. This one, you notice that it starts, you know, it starts easy, like a toy. You know, yeah, it's fine. And then suddenly, boo, 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 you know? And the other one is, you know, it gets intense pretty fast. So both have different characteristics, different frequency contents. So they represent kind of two different ground motions that, you know, are being tested. Okay, this shows the difference between the unanchored and the anchored. And what I want you to see here is just one thing. I don't want you to see all this you know, lots of drawings and lots of time history. What I want you to see is just one thing. One thing. Look at the blue response. The blue response has a high frequency. Yes or no? Yes. The red response has a low frequency. Yes or no? Yes. So why? Why is the response of anchored tanks has a high frequency and the unanchored tank has a low frequency? Answer is because the anchored tanks vibrates based on elastic, the vibration of the, of the uh, I'm sorry, the vibration of the anchor tanks is resulting from the elastic deformation. So it has high frequency vibration. But the unanchor tanks, the vibration is, is resulting from the rocking motion. The entire tank is rocking. Ooh, ooh, like this. So it has a low frequency. Versus the other one, it has a high frequency. So this is what I want you to see here. This is the first thing I want you to see here. This is the overturning moment, meaning that the you know, seismic forces are horizontal. They want to overturn the tank, right? That is the overturning moment right here. Okay, we want to see, compared to the overturning moment of anchored versus unanchored. If I look, I say, well, maybe larger, maybe smaller, larger, smaller. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing to observe. They are comparable, maybe smaller, maybe larger. But if we look at the axial stress, what do you mean by the axial stress? I mean by the vertical stress at the base here. That will cause this thing to buckle, right? That axial stress that will cause this thing to buckle, this is what I study up there. Do you notice that for an anchor tanks, wait a minute, for the same overturning moment, ooh, look at these beaks. The axial stress in the anchor tanks so small, so tiny, and is so big in the unanchor tank. Why? The answer is because what happens is when the unanchored tanks uplift, the contact between the tank and the foundation is small, becomes small. The area of contact becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So you get more stress concentration, right? In the anchored tank, the reaction is distributed all over the entire area. But in the unanchored tank, when the unanchored tank uplifts, the reaction is distributed over a smaller and smaller area. So you get more stress concentration. And the more uplift you get, the smaller is the, uh, the area of contact, the more stress concentration you're getting. So this is the second thing that I want you to see here. So one, high frequency versus low frequency. Second, the stress concentration up there. Okay. All right. Now. This is the base case where we have linear 
we have a stiffness of 1,000 pound branch per inch squared. We have one inch of base blade thickness, small deflection theory without uh, plasticity. This is the base case. And this is when we decrease the stiffness. What happens when we decrease the stiffness? We notice lots of parameters here increase. Some parameters increase and some parameters decrease. So what? What do I want to say out of this? What I want to say is the following. When I decrease the stiffness, what happens? The rocking period, the rocking period right here, the rocking mood of the tall tank, okay, the period increased, but for the broad tank, showed almost no change. The rocking period for the tall tank increased. For the broad tank, no change. Why? Because for the broad tank, the area of the base blade in the middle is almost inactive. It's not going up, it's not going down for the broad tank. What is going up and down are the areas near the tank wall. They are going up and down. This is the active area. So because if you change the stiffness, because most of the base blade and the broad tank is inactive, so if you change the stiffness, the period will not change. But in the tall tank, the entire base plate is, you know, rocking with the foundation. So this is one reason why you're getting that change. The second thing is that when the second thing is that when you increase the foundation stiff when you decrease the foundation stiffness, when the foundation becomes more soft, the contact area becomes larger. The contact area becomes larger. When you increase the foundation stiffness, it becomes stiffer. The contact area becomes smaller. Meaning that you get larger contact area, so you get smaller stress concentration, and you get smaller values of axial stress. A third thing that I would like also to say is that when you decrease, when you increase the frequency, you get more impulsive mood. Impulsive mood is the flexible mood in the tank that causes the hydrodynamic pressure. So you get more hydrodynamic pressure when you increase the frequency. So when you decrease the frequency, the hydrodynamic pressure goes down, and the overturning moment as well goes down as well. How about large deformation? I'm coming to a quick conclusion here. So um, for large deformation, you know, when you have large deformation, you get the membrane component working with the bending component. So what happens is that it decreases the uplift. Decreasing the uplift means that increasing the contact area means that less stress concentration means that, you know, we are getting better response. Okay. How about plastic hinges? When we do have plastic hinges, we get more uplift means that more stress concentration. Why? Because it is less contact area, so we get more stress concentration. So by having plastic hinges. Okay. How about decreasing the thickness of the, um, the base plate? Um, the thickness of the base plate in the anchor tank is governed by, if the tank is broad, then it is governed by this thickness. So when you have a thicker plate, when you have a thinner plate, you have a softer uh, stiffness, you have less stiffness. So you have the period, the, the, the frequency goes down. So you have less overturning moment, and you have less uplift, and you have less stress concentration. Finally, conclusion. Yeah, I'm just going to leave the conclusion on and open the door for questions.